Good morning and welcome to worship. Welcome to First Reformed Church of Tampa. It is good to be together with all of you online, as well as all of you who are gathered here in, in our ministry center. It is good to be here post-Christmas to worship Christ, the newborn King. And so we're going to do that. We're going to sing our praise to the Lord. We're going to read scripture. We're going to pray to Almighty God today. We're going to give him glory and praise. And so we have gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let's do something that typically we don't do. We don't usually read an entire psalm as our call to worship, but Psalm 148 is just an incredible psalm, and it speaks so so highly of God. And so listen to this and interact with this passage of Scripture. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Amen. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not, shall not pass, pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind, fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints and for the people of Israel who are near him. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to do that today? Are you ready to exalt the name of Jesus? Are you ready to, to tell God how great and awesome he is? And so I pray that you are. And as we do that, may God's grace and his peace and his mercy be yours. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray and then let's stand and sing. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your glorious presence. Thank you so much for your grace through Christ Jesus that saves us. We thank you that Christ Jesus was born that he lived perfectly, that he died on the cross, that he was buried in the tomb, and that he rose again and now sits at your right hand in glory. We praise you for our Savior, and so we come to worship you. Fill us with your spirit. May our, may our mouths and our lives give you praise today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, would you stand with us, please, and let's worship.
God who reigns forevermore. Our life is not characterized by pandemics and by the problems. Our life is characterized by the King of kings and Lord of lords to whom we belong. You have saved us from sin and you have given us your promises and it's in you we find our joy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Spend a few moments meeting and greeting one another, passing the peace of Christ. It's good to see some faces we haven't seen for a while visiting. It's also good to see the faces that we see on a weekly basis. And so pass the peace of Christ. east side of the room. It is so good to be with you. God bless you. The peace of Christ be with you. Online folk, it is good to be with you today as well. Don't forget to use that, that chat feature in YouTube or get your cell phone out and, and text somebody a good morning. And west side of the room, it is so good to be with you. God bless all of you. The peace of Christ be with you. It is so good to be with you. I wasn't sure exactly how we would show up today, if we would be a little sluggish because of the activities of the last few days, but you all were singing great here in the room. I pray that you all were singing with us on, uh, at home as well. Our God has done some incredible things for us, especially in Christ Jesus. He's forgiven us of our sin. He's put us on uh, the path of righteousness. And one of the ways that he does that is that he reminds us how he wants us to live. And so the law today, we're going to back to a tried and true, one that we, we read often and recite often here. But I also want to remind you that next Sunday is a communion Sunday. And so let's begin that process of examining our lives, of confessing sin, of repenting of sin so that we, when we come to the table next week, we come in a manner worthy of our Savior. And so this week I want to read from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus has told us very clearly what he expects of us. We are to love God with all of our heart and we are to demonstrate that love for God by loving our neighbor as well. The Christmas season oftentimes is a time where we, we grow in that, where, where oftentimes charity, uh, charities uh, have an influx of income, not just because people are trying to get the tax write off before the end of the year, but because this time of the year invokes love in our hearts. In fact, we just watched the movie The Man Who Invented Christmas or something like that about Charles Dickens. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. But at the end of that movie, it said that charitable giving in England at that time, after his book was published, skyrocketed because people were convicted because of love to be able to, to give more. And so may the law of God convict us to, with an outpouring of righteousness, a desire to be holy because we love the Lord our God and we love our neighbor. Let's enter into a time of prayer. Let's examine our life. Let's confess any sin, knowing he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of unrighteousness. Let's pray to Almighty God. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you today to, again, praise and glorify your holy name. 
and also to recognize that you have instructed us how you desire for us to live. Jesus modeled it. His Every second of his life while here on earth was a testimony of righteousness and holiness. And so we come before you to, to say thank you for that example. Thank you for his teaching. Thank you for the instruction, the commands that he's given to us. But we also come to say we are sorry and to repent that we've not often, well, we've not always this past week lived unto your glory, to loving you first and foremost. We at times have not loved our neighbor as ourself. We've done that in our individual life. We've done that corporately as, as your covenant people. We've seen that in our city, our community. Forgive us of our sin, Father. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Turn our hearts Turn our hearts to, to you through your spirit and give us a hunger for righteousness, to be holy, to demonstrate the difference that Jesus makes. And we pray for this transformation because we want you to be glorified. We want the world to see the light of Jesus. We want the world to come to saving faith in our Savior. And so empower us us to speak boldly, empower us to, to live out loud the gospel, and may people hear and see Jesus in us this week. Prepare us to come to the table, to be nourished by our Savior, to do so with an understanding that he died to save us from sin, and so sin is the last place we want to turn to. We want to be the people of God righteous, and holy, set apart for your use. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, not only is our reading from the law one that we <clears throat> often quote, and we can, we can quote uh, out loud, or even without reading on the screen, but we also have uh, uh, some words of assurance that many of you could probably recite without looking up at the screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He's speaking to you, brothers and sisters. He is speaking to you that Jesus came to save you, to take that sin problem away and put righteousness in you. Isn't that awesome? Isn't it? Let's unwrap that present every day of our lives, living unto his glory in the grace that he's given us in Christ Jesus. Let's celebrate that with some good music. you. Praise team, coming up and join me as we prepare to dive into God's word. Let's sing a hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain. I'm going to invite you to stand with us as we sing this, and let's sing this as a declaration of how we want to live our life this week, to tell the message of Jesus to the world.
Jesus Christ is born. And look to your neighbor and say, He died for you. Amen. And He rose again, and He has given us new life and new hope in Him. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's find our joy in Jesus. joy is here, not simply because we are in the building, but because Jesus has been born and Jesus has died for our sins. I know that the third week of Advent is the, is the week of joy, and we, and we remembered it then. But I wanted to cycle back and speak a little bit more about joy because sometimes when Christmas is over and, and maybe you put a lot into it this year with the tree and the presents, and maybe now that family has gone back to, to wherever they live and you are back to, to the, the routine again, maybe, maybe there's that temptation to, to go back into old thought patterns and, and to not, and not let the joy of the Lord grow into our hearts. And so I just want to spend a few moments today reminding us about what happens when we come face to face with Jesus, even the baby Jesus. And if you go back to Christmas Eve and we were, we were tracking with the shepherds and the joy that they had in seeing the baby Jesus, we've, we've got more people here that are going to testify to us of the joy that Jesus brings into our lives. So Heavenly Father, fill us with your spirit and fill us with your joy. Father, there are many people across the world and some that are in this room right now who, who are dealing with a lot of heavy things. And it is at times hard to find joy in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the uncertainty, in the midst of the, the, the cacophony of all of the different noise in our life. It's so hard at times, but we come before you to quiet our hearts, to simply hear the word of God read, and to sink deep in the joy that Jesus brings. So fill us now to understand your word and apply it to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, starting in verse 10, and then we're going to read through chapter 62, 
verse 3. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress. And as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as the garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory and you shall be called by a new name and the mouth of the Lord, that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hands of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The word of the Lord. Now, the book of Galatians. In fact, before we turn to the book of Galatians, it just dawned on me. Chapter 61, into Isaiah, chapter 61, at the end of verse two, it says, to comfort all who mourn. Remember that phrase because it's key when we get to our gospel passage. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, saying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. Again, the word of the Lord. And finally, our gospel passage comes from the gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. Luke 2, 22 through 40. Brothers and sisters, the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him, Jesus, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arms And blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at the very hour, she began to give thanks to the Lord and speak of him to to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Brothers and sisters, this is the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. So let me ask you this. Now that we are post-Christmas, and maybe your trees are bare and there's nothing left under them, maybe you didn't get quite what you had hoped for. I don't know. As adults, I don't quite put my hopes nearly as high as I did when I was a kid. 
I was that kid when, that wanted that Red Ryder BB gun when I, was, when I was a kid and didn't quite get it as, as, as quickly as I thought I should have. But what would be the most amazing thing that could ever happen to you? If you could receive a gift or an event that happened in your life, in your mind, what would be the most amazing thing that could ever happen to you? Maybe some of us define that in terms of money. And so maybe we would win a bunch of money and never have to have a financial worry ever again. Or maybe you, you would you'd dream of, a, of another house or being in a different dream location. Or maybe, maybe for you, it's just to be perfectly healthy and, and having a vitality that maybe you're, you're not experiencing right now. Where would you find your greatest joy if it dropped into your life? May I point you in a different direction? If, if, if you're still trying to find that joy in material things or find your joy in things that are centered here on this earth. Because I want to point us, surprise, surprise, to Jesus. <laughs> I want, to, I want to point us to where we truly find joy, a joy that does not fade away. The word for joy in the original language is the word kara. It's an interesting short little word, kara. And, and if you kind of break it down, it means to extend favor or to lean towards. The root of that word means to lean in towards something, to be favorably disposed to something. And, and it's really interesting when you start taking a look at some of the other words in the New Testament that are very important to us that, that are based on the same root word. One of them is the word charis. Anybody know what that one is? It's the word for Grace. It is the free gift of God, the same root that God has found favor with his people, that that he's given this this free gift. So remember that, charis, because it's going to be important for us when we we get to this root word for for joy. There's another word, chairo, which means I rejoice, that I I will sing out praise and and exclaim my joy for what God has done. Same root, that, that root char is in there. So I rejoice. And so we've been given charis, um, to, which, is, which is grace. We got chairo, which we can rejoice. And now we have this word chara, joy. Now, it's important for us as believers to, re- to re- remember that. Because so often what happens is, is, is we'll do those word studies. And it's a nice little in- intellectual exercise that we do, but we don't carry it through. Because when it comes to finding joy, instead of finding our ultimate joy uh, rooted in God's grace and that I rejoice because of what God has done and that the joy that fills my heart is, is, is based on what God has done and not what I receive, that makes a world of difference. Because too many people, including too many Christians, are basing their joy off of what's happening to them, the things that they receive, as opposed to what God has done. And as Christians, no matter what happens in our life, we can always, always, always point to what God has done for us. Money doesn't last. It doesn't last. It's here today, and it's one broken air conditioner gone tomorrow. Okay, money doesn't last. Houses fall down. I was looking at the roof of my back porch, realizing that the drywall used for the roof, the ceiling is, the gap is getting a little bit wider. We had a roof leak a few years ago, and so uh, I'm going to have to do something about that. You know, the houses will start falling down, and and <clears throat> our beauty fades away. All of these things that are, that are grounded and rooted in our world here does not last, but God's grace will never, ever, ever fail. Can I quote another highly memorable passage of Scripture? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is what we need to hear. And this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. See, for us as believers, our boast has to always go back to Jesus. Our, our boast has to always go back to what God has done for us. And so grace 
leads us to salvation through faith. Grace always leads us back to God. Grace always reminds us that it is a gift to be received with an open hand from God. And that is where our joy is found. And so, brothers and sisters, let's hold out our hands today and let's receive those gifts from God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? We don't sing songs like that too much in in this day. We don't like to characterize ourselves as wretches and worms, but apart from God, what are we? Wretches and worms, but we are saved by grace. Hallelujah. We are saved by grace. And so we don't have to manufacture our own joy. God has given it to us. God is the source of our joy. As I was writing this this week, the the, the kid's song that, that I used to sing as a kid, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Yeah, that's, I don't know if you sang it the same way we did, but then we had to yell as loud as we could where that joy was. I have joy like a fountain. Maybe we need to bring our kids in at times and have them sing some songs with us and do the hand motions with them so that as we are, as we are singing and acting out these songs, we're reminded that God has blessed us in so many ways. Joy to the world the Lord has come. See, we sing about it, and we sing all these wonderful things about joy, and then at times it's so easy for us to walk away and go, oh, back to Monday. Uh, Christmas wore me out. May that never be. May God lead us to full joy every single day, just like Simeon and Anna Simeon and Anna are testimonies to us of people who persevered for many years, looking, 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 and waiting for the Messiah. And when they finally were able to hold that Messiah, they were overwhelmed with joy. And so people of God, let's keep the main thing the main thing as we close out this year and get ready to launch into a new year that Christ Jesus has come to earth. And Christ Jesus has lived perfectly. And Christ Jesus has died for our sins. And he has given us new life. And so may the joy of the Lord just well up within us more and more and more as we seek him. So do you, how many of you would like to have a little bit more joy in your life? You want more joy? Anybody want more joy? You are the happiest people in the, the most joyful people in the world. Hallelujah. Help me then. Pray for me. Because we all need more joy. And how do we find it? We find it the way Simeon and Anna did. They looked for Jesus. See, they started off by being spirit-led and watching for the Messiah. They were spirit-led and watched for the, the Messiah. So if you still have your Bibles open, take a look at verse 25. Luke 2, verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. That word consolation can be, can be translated also comfort. That's why I wanted to reference Isaiah 61 too. As a prophet, Isaiah had prophesied about the comfort that would come to Israel, and this was what Simeon was waiting for. Now, some of us in this room are a little longer in the tooth than others. That's not a criticism. That's just observing the facts. And some of us in here who, who are a little older, we have been waiting and waiting and waiting for a long time. And for, especially for those who've been anticipating the return of Jesus, sometimes that wait seems like it just continues on and on and on. And the longer we wait for something, sometimes it's easy to give up hope. But apparently from this text, Simeon had not given up hope. He was still watching for the consolation of Israel. He was persistent and consistent, and the Spirit of the Lord was on him, which enabled him to continue to wait and to watch. I have to thank my 
my new friend Jay here. You, you turned me on to a book that I've been listening to, and it's been kicking me all over the place, this book called Essentialism. It's a book about, about identifying what's truly important and, and, and trying to get some of the fluff out of our lives that, that oftentimes can be a distraction. How many times can these things be a distraction? Notifying, dinging, belling, buzzing, you know, telling, telling us something's going on in our life that we need to give that thing all the attention in the world at that moment. We have so many distractions. And yet when we take a look at Simeon's life, we see that he was dedicated to watching for the Lord. And so sometimes we need to step back and, and cut back on the things that distract us. Maybe it's the, the music or talk radio. Maybe it's even as we're driving around, focusing on the billboards. Now that we have these billboards that are always changing every few seconds, we've got even distractions out there. The commercials on our TVs or even the GPS directions in our, in our car. We have all these distractions that, that surround us. And at times we just need to, to pare back and focus more and more on what's truly important. And so that was one of the reasons why Advent as we light candles, as we go through the various themes for the various days, are a, are, are a way to help us try to focus in. It's a way for us to remind ourselves that we need to be waiting for Jesus. Many people longed for the Messiah. Many people were looking for the Messiah in Simeon's day, but not everybody was actively waiting and looking and putting themselves in the right place. Simeon and Anna longed for Jesus, and they kept looking for him and looking for him and wishing for him. Do we have that same, that same heartfelt desire to continue to look for Jesus, to await his return, but also to find how he's working in our lives today, how he's instructing us in his word? Are we listening to, to be led by the Holy Spirit Simeon was led by the Holy Spirit. The text tells us this. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so he was in tune with the Spirit. And the Spirit ultimately led him to where he needed to be. See, Spirit leading as we seek the Messiah will put us in the right place at the right time. That's the second thing I see in this text. Not only was he Spirit-led, and watching and waiting for the Messiah, that his focus was on Jesus. <clears throat> but he also found his joy in this, in terms of righteous living, being in the right place at the right time. Now, it's, it's interesting that when we seek to be holy as God is holy, when we seek to be like Jesus, how he will open up doors for us as we're living that holiness out. You know, as we're keeping our eyes on where Jesus is and going where he is going, sometimes we will have these spirit-moved uh, divine appointments in our life. And so as he was waiting for the consolation, the comfort of Israel, the spirit led him to the temple. And at times in our lives, if we follow the prompting of the spirit, we will intersect our lives with others as the spirit is moving where we can have those divine moments as well, where we see where God uses us in Christ to be a blessing to others. I mean, we don't know how old Simeon was. We have an idea, Anna, about 84. My take from the text is that Simeon was also older as well. And yet, even at this age, he was still seeking to live righteously and be where God needed him to be. You know, it can be discouraging when you've done the right thing for such a long time and you've not gotten the payoff that you thought you might get. And sometimes when, when we do that, it can be a very, not just a discouraging thing, but it can fill our hearts with pain when, when things don't seem to go the way that we thought it would by our righteous living. But we can always hold on to the promises that God has given to us. We've talked about that during Advent. You know, Psalm 30, verse 5, Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. That word for for weeping, rina, is translated as a ringing cry of proclamation. 
I, I'm sorry, that's not the weeping one. It's this joy comes with the mourning. It's this proclamation of joy and praise. In the Lord, we find joy. And so Simeon, even though his, he was old, found joy in the Lord, found joy in seeking. The other day, I was watching a Mike Rowe Dirty Jobs. I just needed something brainless to, to watch. And so I was watching a Dirty Jobs, and he was, and he was talking about um, just the this, what, what was the one that was, I don't know why I went down that road. The, the brain is sometimes is tired and it doesn't quite remember everything that we want. Um, where was I going with that? I don't know. I'll just move on. Um, <coughs> I, need, I need a break. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you're not the only one, brother. No, you're not the only one. Um, we find joy as we seek to do what God is, is leading us to do. We find joy when we consciously seek to do what is right. Sometimes doing the right thing can be a hard thing to do, even when you've been doing it for so long. But have you ever found this? Have you ever found where sin just gnaws at your soul? Have you ever found this when, when you realize that that when you're not pursuing righteousness and you want to pursue your own desire, how sin just gnaws at you. I get the impression from Simeon, as he was being led by the Spirit, as he was watching for the Lord, that as he's living righteously, that God put him in many different situations where he could experience the love of the Lord. And here in the temple at this moment, his life intersected with the one thing he was looking for most of all, Jesus. And I want you to look back in your life and see when you came to faith in Christ. Many of you had those intersecting moments as well where somebody entered into your life. Maybe it was that you were born into their family and God, God surrounded you from a very young age with that person was going to lead you to the Lord. That was my story. My dad led me to the Lord, my mom and dad raised me in the faith. It was my dad who, who led me to that moment where I said, yes, I believe in Jesus. But maybe for some of you, it was, a, it was a story where you were heading one direction and you were completely met by a stranger who introduced you to Jesus. Simeon, his life intersected with Jesus. And in many ways, God is still working in our lives to intersect us with opportunities to either receive that message of the gospel or to give that message of the gospel. See, joy is being in the right place for the, for the right reason. Joy can be found when we desire to be righteous and to bring glory to God. And so as you are being led by the Spirit, I pray that you constantly seek to do the right thing. Because joy can be found being led by the Spirit, and joy can be found in righteous living, and joy can be found just as, Mo, as, as Simeon and Anna found by actively praising and thanking the Lord. Did you notice their words when they, when they finally met Jesus? You know, many of you have, when you have met your when you met your child first, or you met your grandchild, or for some of you, maybe your great-grandchild, and you were able to take that child in your arms, what was the emotion that welled up within you? It's something amazing, isn't it? You know, just this past Monday, we celebrated my daughter's birthday. I remember taking her up in my arms. We have a story that we tell every year about how Daddy saved her from the mean heat lamp you know, in, in the hospital. Now she was turning red and, and nearly blistering up, but, but Super Dad came in and scooped her up and held her in his arms and kept her warm, and the mean heat lamp couldn't get to her. But it was something else about just holding, holding my child. And, and for each one of you all, of you, all of our children mean so much to us when we take our kids in our arms. I'm now to that age... Will, that you mentioned, you know, that, that brain moment. I, I am looking forward to that first grandchild. You know, my son's getting married in June. I'm hoping that it happens soon. I can't wait for, for grandchildren. Can't wait to, I can't wait to hand them back when there's the mess, you know, that kind of thing. 
I can't wait. Because there's something about that little child that speaks of, of, the, of the creation of the Lord and the love for him. But can you imagine this time when Simeon is holding the Messiah, the consolation of Israel, this child he had been looking for for decades, and he finally held him and knew that he could pass from this world in peace because God had kept his promise. Imagine that. That God had kept his promise to Simeon. What joy that speaks to us. And so the words that come out of his mouth is praise and glory, verses 29 to 32. Just praising the Lord. My eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples. His first response was to praise God. And Anna... Her words were, were words of thanksgiving as well. What comes out of your mouth first as you encounter life? Sometimes our words really do reveal whether we are finding joy in Jesus or not. Matthew 15, verses 18 and 19 says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. So there was a conversation about what makes a person unclean, and they were talking about about foods and things like that. And Jesus wanted to flip that conversation because it wasn't the foods, it was what's in here. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. So what's the first thing out of your mouth? Is it words of joy and praise or is it something else? Simeon's words gushed with love and appreciation for God. Do, do yours? Mine don't always. I need to work on that. Simeon and Anna thanked the Lord because for years, decades, they sought the Lord first and foremost. They found the Lord by allowing the Spirit to lead and to guide and to strengthen. They found the Lord by consistently doing the right thing day in and day out. And that doing the right thing and being led by the Spirit directed their lives to be able to intersect where God needed them just at that moment. And when they finally experienced this long-promised uh, meeting with the Messiah, their words just gushed and gushed with praise and thanksgiving. Be quick to praise God, brothers and sisters. Continue to look for ways to thank Him and to praise Him. And always just lean towards praise and thanksgiving with your lives as you obey, as you allow the Spirit to lead, as you appreciate what God is doing for you. Praise and thank God profusely for his grace, his charis. Praise and thank God profusely that he allows you to chairo, to rejoice. Praise and thank God profusely for the chara that he puts in our hearts, the joy that we may be filled with the mind and the heart of God our Savior. And if you need more joy in your life, I encourage you now to maybe spend a few moments of reflection and repenting again of saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I've let the world get the better of me. I'm sorry. I've not let your spirit lead. I've tried to do things on my own. I'm sorry. I haven't been living righteously or seeking to live righteously. And I need to get that right in my life. And I've just been quick to complain, to try and, to, try to get anybody to listen to my complaints. Forgive me. I need to be praising and thanking you more and more. May our lives be a testimony of the great things God has done for us. And may our lives reflect these two great saints of old who spent their lives, decades worth of their lives, seeking the Lord and rejoicing when they found him. We've all found him, right? We found him. So we have every, every, every reason to just gush forth with praise every second of our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you Thank you for the joy you give us. Thank you that we do not have to live life in discouragement. We just have to remember the day that we came to faith in Christ, the day that we recognized and realized that we believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Maybe some were here who are baptized as babies, but had that moment of realization who Jesus is. Thank you. Thank you for that. And maybe some are here who learned that later on in life and were baptized later in life. Thank you for those moments of recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah. Simeon and Anna waited for it and were blessed and they rejoiced. And so we continue to rejoice in knowing we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. We believe he is, as this text talked about, the consolation, the comfort of Israel. We believe that he came to restore and to renew. And we believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. We put our faith and trust in him and his sacrifice on the cross that paid the penalty for our sin. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us, please, as we conclude our service? And let's sing with the angels. sung, as you've prayed, as we've talked about the Word of God today, that you've been encouraged. Uh, just a couple things to note. I know that we've been handing out those Heidelberg Catechism. There are actually some announcements on the other side. That's my way of getting you to pick the things up and not only read the Heidelberg Catechism, but see some of the announcements that are on the other side. On Tuesday, January 4th, we're going to dehang these greens, and so I would love to have some help, and so I'm going to invite you to come and have a brunch with me. So bring some brunch-type items. We'll, we'll dehang the greens and just have this little time of fellowship afterwards. On, that's on on January 4th, my family and I, we're going to be gone for uh, much of this week, going to go see our Marine and celebrate Christmas with him. So if you need anything, contact our elders and deacons, and they would be uh, love to help you out. I know that there'll be some people here in the morning, so if get the word out. If they need to come get their Christmas cards, check from the, the mailbox for your Christmas cards. Um, and there'll be some, pe- be pe- some people here tomorrow morning. Just check with uh, Carol Cashel. Um, it's so, so good to be with you. May the Lord bless you. Hear these words of blessing and benediction as, you, as we leave this place. May the God of encouragement and 
uh, endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Be blessed. Have a great week. I love you.